Yes, the question is, the big question, of course, has the map been hidden, Des, or has it been avoided? <laughs> That's the big question, the unknown at this point. They pretty much permabanned Villa for the longest time and then brought it out and we were all like, oh, BDS are going to Villa. Everyone's on their toes dancing around, like nervous trepidation about what might happen. And I think, sadly, they did lose that first game on Villa. Tried it again a couple of weeks later, lost it again and thought, yeah, forget about it. We're not going back, back there to the again. Permaban. Exactly. And this is an interesting band, the Buck coming out. Whenever I think of Buck, we think of two players. I think Alamau is one and I always think of Shaiko and Oregon. His West pushes with his operator always shine through. But here it's BDS banning it away. I think it's a little bit bit of a nod towards the uh, the vertical aspect of this map we know how important those vertical holds are both for defenders and attackers you're going to see the attackers in many cases pretty much other than when attacking onto the basement if they're attacking anywhere else they're going to want to use verticality because there's a lot of soft floors Slash ceilings, they're the same thing, essentially. There's a lot of soft partitions between levels where you can just get in there and open them up. And removing that book is at least taking away some of that ability. The ability, particularly, Des, is to get underneath on a master and office site and open it up because, of course, Sledge is unable to do that. What I found interesting was the other day, a couple of times, G2 did struggle to open up the K9 wall from below. They had an Asher as Ophir and still couldn't find the Electro Claws that were present, for example. But Kanto, in every single attacking round they had, played this book. Talk about targeting a man while he's down, Ace, because Kanto, as we said, all tournament long, not having the best of times at the minute. It goes deeper, Des. If we look back to EUL Stage 1, the last time that we saw these two teams face off, BDS won 7-4. And who was the top player for GD G2 that day, Des? Who got the most frags? It was Kanto with 10. So, as you say, coming in and just really... Really hamstringing him, potentially. <laughs> Always up for a little bit of kicking a man while he's down. We'll see what he can do in this game. But let's get into it as round number one is away. The Frost being brought out by Uno. Always seeing this with Rooney becoming quite present on this map. I still recall the first game of EUL. We had Na'Vi versus Trainhard. Trainhard starting on defense in almost every single defensive round. Had that a Rooney on side. Up on the top floor then, we've got the setup going down. The laser gates will be applied to the windows in library. So just a little nod from G2 as to the importance of that library holders. They do not want BDS being able to go in there and make themselves a beachhead, which is often the master plan for the attackers here on a master and office push. It's about getting that top floor control other than the site itself and then looking to just ring fence the defenders back in essentially. You'll quite often get a rappel or a presence inside of Solarium as well and just looking to try and force the defenders to play from sight. But as we can see, G2, they're not too keen on that to begin with. They've got a number of players off on the roam, which is no surprise. It's something that they had success with last time. Mezzanine, they're going to hold on to that with their lives, Des. Absolutely. The starting point, as you mentioned, is this kind of library side, the west point. You can indeed attack from solar. As you mentioned, a lot of teams, when they're defending this site, like to have a full-on extension inside a library. They bring ADSs, a shield, a bunch of reinforcements, and for the side of G2, it's been a little bit more open than that. They've opened up a good number of these walls with these kind of head level sight lines all the way through and just looking to waste time inside for as long as they can in library to see if they can run the clock down for BDS. But BDS are one of the most time conscious teams that we have in Europe. Very rarely are they pushing into a site with 10 seconds left on the clock. They like to give themselves a lot more time than that. I was about to say we're still looking for the entry kill here to come out though and 80 seconds in, it's going to be Citizen finding a lamb to Shaiko. Says peekaboo to Virgil. Virtue puts him in the dirt. Virtue just overextending a little bit there, looking to peek on into library. Maybe not oh. sure of Shaco's presence, but Kayak, he's able to take that information and use it, getting himself a kill. Kanto comes out with nice. a headshot and a double. That's what we want to see, Des. Kanto coming in big in round number one, taking Rafal off the board. And this is all going to G2 right now as Ranchiro. He manages to find himself a near kill from K9, but surely this is going to be too little too late as he tries to move in through the window. Kayak, he's going to find the long range Jesse. G kill, and that is round one going to G2. No way he was getting in that window when there's three people watching the angle and there's a frost mat waiting underneath. Like, you you shoot a player, you're going to jump straight into a frost mat. You're absolutely screwed. And as soon as that came down to the one man left alive, I think it was quite telling how that was going to come out. But again, the player that we put a bit of focus on, 
Kanto, two big kills from the top of library stairs in that round. Really secures the bag for G2. Good first defense. BDS not really ever able to get the control they needed inside a library. And I think for Shaiko in a moment, it looked like he might achieve something, but didn't account for a mute spraying him down from downstairs. Interesting from Alems there on the Zafia Des. It seems to be BDS's answer to that book ban that they've brought along themselves. And that was Alems getting in underneath and using those explosive grenades of the Zafia to open up those vertical angles that we spoke about obviously limited having taken the book away themselves and then he was reasonably easily shut down by a citizen from the stairs as well and nice peek on to him and it's just something to watch out for 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 everybody at home as this one progresses there's just to see if bds have actually realistically impacted on themselves with that book ban they you know very limited now as to what they can do underneath and alems tried to do a bit of something tried to move the defenders round inside a site didn't really pan out and got himself taken down as the entry kill as well Realistically, they've still got, what, like nine bites at the chariot, catching someone out from below or opening things up with the two impacts, the three breaching rounds. You've got the four frags they're bringing along. There's a lot on side here to make an impact from below if it, the round mandates, if they need it. But here, given we're playing on the top floor for the defense and looking downstairs into kitchen, this is where it's been more about the sledge really coming into effect, I think. So for BDS, it's going to be all about that top floor control. They want to get upstairs, start forcing those members from G2 back downstairs, and then start looking for the execute once they've picked up a couple of them. It really depends how aggressive G2 are being on their roams. And the other day, pretty much every single round was a full roam off the map, trying to make best use of all three floors where they could. We'll see if it blends into being that here. Shaiko slightly conscious of someone maybe peeking at the window. And of course, it's going to be Virtue on the Jaeger. I like the level of pressure that we saw out of G2 on the roam. It felt just about right, does back mm. in round one. They were happy to get in there, take those opening engagements, but they didn't overcommit themselves to them. They didn't throw lives away trying to get those early picks. And it's looking very much the same. Here, we're a minute into the round. We don't really have too much of a coming together yet, but we've got plenty of G2 presence up on that top floor. Just saying, Yep, we know BDS. Well, you want to get in here. You want to get Renshiro established and you want to open up everything there is above us. Now, Citizen, he's going to be playing in that office position. He's going to lock himself in there for as long as possible. I think it was Neskin that we saw trying to hold on to that back on day one, Des, and it was a tough position to hold down. Now, Shaiko, he's going to find the opener onto Kanto, but immediately traded by Virtue. So G2 once again showing that they're playing well as a team here, doubling up and trading out those kills. Got to give a nod to G uh, BDS, sorry, so much drone work coming in in that first 60 to 75 seconds or so. I think every single man has been on a drone at some point. Relay was on it for the five, 60 seconds at the very start of the round, almost just to make sure they knew where these members of G2 were, set up the odd flank drone in case anything changed, and then think about getting walls open up, which is exactly what they're going for. So collecting certainty and then making the play, the sort of criticism that Empire levied against themselves. Now I think about it, saying we'd often drone something out and then do nothing. We'd drone again, do nothing and repeat that. At least for BDS, there you're seeing that conviction to act on the information they've got whilst one or two other players then stay on the drones to keep feeding them information but with the four versus four and 45 seconds or so to go now's the time to start taking real action in the form of bringing down members of g2 BDS given up on that top floor control, looking for a more lateral push here. They've got the reinforcement opened up. They're pinging out the utility there. They're going to need the Zafia to oh, clear virtue. out or a nade or some sort of explosive to get in and move that evil eye if they don't want the information being fed back in. Now, what a shot from Citizen. Finding the headshot, threading the needle, Des, through two long lines of sight holes there. Just getting the kill onto Renshiro. And this one is and all I going in favour of G2. It really feels like BDS are out of eye. Ideas, Des. They've got themselves in. They've opened up those lines of sight early and then not really done too much with them. But Breedy manages to find one onto the flank in Virtue. In they go to try and get the plant down. Now, G2 still have vertical control. Can they use it? Not at this point as Breedy. He is successful. And what seemed like a dead end for Breedy, for Breedy and for BDS, they've managed to just smash that wall open, Des, and get the diffuser down. Kayak finds himself now one versus three. Cuts it down to one versus two. But still an awful awful lot of work to do in the next 20 seconds. I thought that was his body lying on the ground there. Absolutely not the case. The thing is, Rafael and Lems are both quite low HP. He's got about 15 seconds to get those two kills and start the defuse, which is my worry. I think he has no idea. And the boys on BDS naturally being very, very conservative here, feeling no need to go aggressive and try and collect the kills. Just let him come to you and they will come regardless. For all I said about BDS not being a 10 second team, that is one of the tighter executes I think I've ever seen them pull off where they left it until about 
about the 14 second mark before Bride ran into sight, knowing there was a mozzie inside of Kitchen, but fortunately, the cross angle that got set up, absolutely perfect. Some good shots coming back from G2, but BDS still showing they've got the right idea here, even if it takes quite a bit of time to make it happen. Well, this is why I said, does it, you know, at a point it looked like BDS had stalled out because we really don't expect to see that final 10 second execute from them. But, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to go and watch that round back and see exactly what's happened with G2 there on the defence. Kayak upstairs, unable to make any sort of impression on that plant. Breede was pretty much free to go in and just get that diffuser down on the ground. I think the Maestro cam would have been dealt with by that yeah, point. We didn't see it get taken out, but I think it would have been. But still... If you've got that vertical presence as the defenders, you've not been moved. BDS thought about it in the early round. Rafal moved up, drawn out library very quickly, but they pretty much abandoned it and just said, you know what, that's fine. You have the top floor. We're just going to open up the wall and go in route one through main door. And it paid off. Looks like we're going to see a vertical roam, as we very often see on the bar and gaming site. Now, I remember actually watching back the end of Reaper's stream last night, and we were looking at the stats as they kind of came in. I think the win rate on this site was like 16%, 1 in 6 or something ridiculous. It was disgusting. I think teams really struggle to hold on for the longest time in the top floor. And once the plant comes in, think about Team 1 the other day jumping in through the double window and getting a plant down. Lagonis just stealing the round away from G2. It was disgusting. So some question marks around G2 set up on this site, no doubt. We'll see if they change anything here. But the minute looks pretty default. You've got the hole at the top of library stairs there, no doubt, with the shield and a couple of ADSs stacked in. That's to stop them easily getting vertical control inside of library. No doubt may see one or two players also holding library itself before dipping away and playing a little bit safer. Virtue is playing the full roam game, it feels, throughout all three rounds so far, too. As he's currently pushed up towards Solar, looking to cause a bit of trouble and catch out some drones on their initial push into the map. A site with an area like the one that we see as the default plant spot here in the games room is always going to be difficult to hold on to, Des, because you've got that double window leading into an area that is heavily covered, effectively. It's a perfect plant spot. It just places even more importance on the corridor that runs between the two sides. You need to hold on to that because that is your area as a defender to challenge onto that plant spot from. So watch how that progresses through the round. Do G2 hold on to that or are they forced away from it from BDS? As soon as they are forced away, it makes their lives as attackers much easier to get in and get that diffuser down. Now Shaco, he's looking to sweep across that top floor. It's going to be a Lems to find Virtue who's been quiet so far inside of these first three rounds. He's suffered as the opening death there, and he's certainly been one of the first two to go in all of the rounds so far. And this is looking like a good top floor clearance coming in from BDS. So that is really step one complete, Des. Really smart. Two or three players pushing in from the north, then running into the tight lines from Alems, who's holding the whole angle through library itself in towards the mezzanine stairs. It's just basically pushing them back into a death trap. Really rated it so far. C4 could have been really well timed there, but I think just a second or two too late, too early, whichever way you want to argue it. G2 say, right, okay, we've lost our members. Sure, we've wasted a minute and 45 on the top floor. Now's a good time to get back to sight and really turtle in for what could prove to be rough. LM's clearly acknowledging this as well. Drops down from the top floor and is now holding the double window directly below. That's plants what we were talking about yesterday. Now exposed. Great shot from Renshiro onto Citizen. Five versus three, Ace, and 50 seconds to Play. It's looking good for BDS. Renshiro well aware of where the danger was for him there. Now, Kayak is still in the spot that I was talking about, Des. That's the corridor between the two sites, and he's the one that's there to try and hold down that plant spot. But this is going to become more and more difficult as Shaiko finds one onto Kanto Ricchetti. Five versus two, and Kayak, he's going to be sweating right about now, but he manages to sweat Breede right off the map as he finds himself a headshot. But he is the linchpin now of this oh, defence. Yeah. Shut down. Easy easily by Rafal from above, and that is why you really need to keep hold of that vertical pressure oh. here. Elems shuts down Uno to finish things off, and that is going to be an easy round three for BDS. That was a pretty textbook attack onto bar and game. Kai arguably should have had that last absolute freebie, but that point aside, I do really want to touch on the drone play coming out of the side of BDS, as well as that team play on the top floor. Again, every man on drones in the early round, collecting the info they need, committing and deciding on a play, and then making it happen. That Ayana changing from the Maverick from last time, being used to burn through those Aruni gates as well, making sure they're not going to impede them, have to consume any valuable utility like the frag grenades, and they just execute, 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 Tim. It's what's really delightful about watching both of these teams play. G2 on the road, quite well and aggressive. BDS just feeling one step ahead now ever so slightly though.
They do. To be honest, it feels like BDS have got the answers here. And we could have a look at that and say, well, they've seen G2 play on this map two days ago. And they've been able to just break it down. They had a day off yesterday. They knew that G2 was the first game here. If they've steered those map bands in the direction of Shally, it could show that they've got some confidence having poured over that VOD. And let's not forget, Des, it wasn't a 7-0. It wasn't a 7-1 where you've got limited information. We saw 14 rounds of this map. G2 having to show their hand time and time again in that VOD. So BDS, they've had all the preparation they need. And it's certainly showing here in the first three rounds. So it should be. Haven't seen some of Bill Garage come out yet, which we did see a couple of times the other day. Instead, going back up to that top floor to see how the defense can shape up up there. And a couple of setups on the downstairs, I think, more to try and impede this drone game coming out of the side of BDS. I was kind of expecting to see more Mute Mossy being brought out. I won't lie. I think there's a lot of lean here on the five operators they've got and saying, well, we've already seen how the potential impacts of a Frost can weigh into things in round number one. Virtue on the Jaeger playing an eternal roam game and you need those ADS for the number of nades that are being brought along by BDS for every single round so far. But I'm just thinking again, the util game so strong for BDS. Maybe we've got to try and slow that down in some way, boys. Virtue needs to hold on to that mezzanine for a little bit longer this time than we saw previously. He got himself shut down as Shaiko pushed in from the library but this time he's just going to move himself back a little bit deeper in towards site now Cantor he's just holding a pixel peak for the time being we can see Virtue just trying to hold off a lens from that double window the thing is this position Des is going to make it very difficult for the defenders inside a site they can't really rotate around freely and we're seeing a lot of attention over to the solarium side of things from BDS this time as Shaiko mm. moves himself up those trophy stairs and what I like to see, he gets his, his red hero actually that finds himself a kill down there in trophy and BDS attacking this completely differently, Des, keeping themselves unpredictable. Shaiko, he predicts the movement and gets himself a kill. Kanto shuts down Ren Shiro, three versus four and G2 find themselves on the back foot at the halfway mark once again. Not a massive surprise, it seems to be that way in every single round so far. Just different hits coming out there, comes the jump out from Trophy onto LMs. Kanto with another double kill, same as back in round one, but that has been his only impact so far, rounds two and three silent, but you won't knock him when he's been a massive contribution in potentially their two, one rounds. It is a three versus three, there is 70 seconds to play, there is still a lot of time for BDS to make this one happen, and I'll echo to you the same of what you just said. G2 is going to commend for being quite alternative in their attacks, always changing it up every single round despite the site they were on. Here, BDS have gone for something completely different. They've got full control of the north side of the map and are going for the plant. They kill the last man on site in virtue. There's no stopping this plant going down. Three versus two for BDS and for G2. They're going to have to pull off something special, but they have got Citizen and Kanto, who is on one today. BDS have just played that beautifully, as you say, and take full control of the north side of the map. And then it was a stroll, Des. It was a mm. stroll for Breedy to come in through that bathroom window walk into sight and get the diffuser down and right now Citizen he's trying to find anything that he can but you can just see that the battle line is drawn from BDS and as they try to cross it they move through no man's land Des, and they are left exactly there Shaco and Rafal finish it off with a big double it does not come easier than that from BDS in the post plant and that is 3-1 now and G2 are floundering it's the cute things at the very end of that round like the timing from BDS on that peak coming out of the closet at the same time as someone swung from bathroom just great timing and so many times we've looked at teams who have tried to go for these pushing crossfires at the same time and gone oh if only it was one second more in sync that could have been a double kill coming out bds have just closed that round out beautifully after starting it so well g2 left floundering as you say a little bit static i think on the south side of the map timeout coming in for g2 as shaz as you can see has got that headset down they're having a great conversation right now because my god do they need it Things are looking a little bit tense, Des, if I've got to be honest. I'm looking at the faces of the players there and, you know, it's, it is very serious and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we're in a, an important matchup in the Six Invitational here. Of course, you want your players focused, but it just looks like, honestly, the weight of the world is on G2 right now. I think that's a fair way to put it. In the rounds, it doesn't even feel particularly close, right? And again, I'll put, I'll put this on D2 and say that they aren't playing bad. In terms of their setups aren't bad, their ideas aren't bad, positions of the players I don't think are miles off. It's the adaptability to what happens in the round. One, they're not winning their gunfights against BDS early in the round. I haven't got the exact stats up here, but I'm imagining you might. The entry stats so far, I imagine, quite heavily favouring into, into BDS, sorry. Three and one, there you go. That's for a pretty predicted, I suppose you're supposed to say, looking at the score, you'd say, yeah, that's the way that it should be. 
but it's also the late round maneuverability. No one is really adapting to what's coming out of them, and by the time they're actually pushing back in, it's a little bit too late. Think about their attack inside a kitchen dining, for example. They had one man left on spot to contest. It was Citizen. He was killed, and there was a mozzie then way back up north at the top side of Trophy, pushing down into kitchen, and that was all they really had. A C4 from the right spot could have done enough, but it's like there is nothing G2 can do that is going to surprise BDS. They're just ready for everything. I think the way that I'd put it, Des, to sum it up, is G2 always feel like they're fighting back. Yeah, they're never in the leader of the controlling foot, right? They're always fighting back. It's always about what can they do to interrupt BDS on the attack. And, you know, really, that owner should be on the attackers coming in. The defenders are the ones with the setup. The defenders are the ones that should be... They start with map control. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they have everything in their favour. They've got the clock on their side. They've got the map control to begin with. You know, they should be the ones sort of dictating those early rounds. But from 30 seconds into these rounds, it does always feel like G2 are trying to respond. And as you say, they're lacking that adaptation. It's sort of like, you know, this is how we've set our stall out. This is how we're going to play it. And once we've lost that area... We're not really sure how to regain it. Bit of an alternative setup coming out here as well with that pulse being brought along as opposed to, say, the Aruni that we saw being brought along um, not too long ago. A couple of rounds back. Hoping, I think, after that timeout that we're going to see something a bit different. The fact that there are four C4s on side, you've got the Pulse and the Valkyrie, just screams to me this is absolutely going to be denial-based play. They want those C4 kills. They want to be able to catch them out. What is Brede planting already? No way is he getting oh. away with this. They're inside. So where are G2? Surely the intel comes through. C4 is thrown. It goes off, but Do the it. plan Do is it. down, boys. Disaster strikes! Four versus three now as BDS get everything they want out of that rush onto site and 30 seconds for Kanto and Citizen to turn this round on its head. And they're not going to do it, Des. They're not going to do it. It's four versus one for Team BDS here. And they are coming out with a master class on Shally. They are absolutely turning G2 inside and out right now, Des. It's irrelevant that Illems is downed here. At 12 seconds to go, Kanto needs three kills inside of five seconds. These are going to be impactless. That is it. The timer is too far gone. Seven seconds are required to disable that active diffuser. It's too little, too late, and BDS have just run roughshod over G2 in round number five. You've just had a tactical timeout. You've just agreed, let's roll four C4s with a Valkyrie and a Pulse so we can deal with anything going on above us. And he gets in and gets this plant off. There was a fraction of a second between that C4 going off and the plant going down, but unfortunately, the latter came first. That was decisive by BDS. I think they didn't want to say, let's mess around for two minutes trying to clear them out from downstairs here. Let's just get in and go for it. If it goes wrong, fine. We tried something, we flipped the coin. In this case, it came up heads and they won. I'm sure there'll be a freeze for him of that plant um, on, on Twitter yeah. at some point, you know, with the uh, with it at like 44.96 or something when that kill comes in. Because as you say, it really was a fraction of a second. But Des, it's fractions of seconds that can differentiate rounds here in Siege. And if you're going to play that as a vertical hold, that is the, that, that's the kill you have to get. You have to stop the diffuser going down. If you're going to say, here's sight, feel free, you have to be ready to deny that diffuser and that for me is the the critical part of that defense that has gone wrong allowing that to go down let's not forget about the 15th round theme park toe shot that came out of bds when they were facing off against g2 in their best of five final it was down to Again, literal milliseconds. It feels these two teams are cursed to have experiences like these, but my God, does it make it entertaining as a viewer. 4-1 to BDS on the attack. You may look at that as a conventional Siege fan and say, oh, defenses, every match should be defender sided. You should be taking more defensive rounds than attacking ones. I think the general feeling around the world at the minute is this, this is a an attacker leaning map, sorry, especially on the downstairs. Maybe it's why you've seen G2 not head down there, despite playing it in round number eight of their game against Team 1 the other day, which they won, by the way. So there's a fair case to say, it's, it, teams will play it. This map overall, attack a lean, fine. You can give a bit of a lean towards G2, but from what we've seen so far, BDS again are just a step ahead. And for G2, my God, it does not shape up well. They will be 0-4 and four if, they leave, if they lose this game. And they've got a couple more fixtures to come today that no doubt don't make things any easier. I think Empire the sack up against later as well, which is going to be spicy. Rafal on the IQ there, just using his scanner to pick up the drones that have been captured by Kanto on the mozzie there, trying to take them out with his pistol, but unable to, leaving Kanto to still buzz around that top floor and try to collect 
collect information on exactly where this push is coming from for BDS. Now you see the red ping ahead of you there and what's happening there is that one of the attackers BDS have shot through one of Alibi's decoys and when that happens you will be pinged out for a few seconds, your location given away but it really doesn't matter as G2 are unable to capitalise and Shaiko he's going to find the headshot onto Kanto and now you've also got to remember Des, Kanto had some drones in his possession as the Mozzie, they're now locked in place, nobody else can move them so it all depends, are they in a useful position, are they giving any information to G2 at or this kayak. point, if not they're not going to. He's going so aggressive here as well. No one normally pushes like this. You'll play behind the shield and he will find Rafal there. Catch him off guard, but Shaiko's at the window here. It's Johnny. Scots a little chop through. Catches him out of the backsides of it. Two go down. Make it three. Man, put this guy in a position where he can find a couple of unaware members. And my God, is he going to strike through? It looked for a second after the back of Kayak's play. They maybe find something, but no. Shaiko puts go. him in the dirt. There's Citizen with two. It's flank after flank after flank in this round. And it's a two versus two but we've seen this before race when it's all even on numbers there's 60 seconds to play with I still worry for G2. G2 recognizing though that they need to change things up and make themselves unpredictable Des moving around much better a lot more mobile there and able to capitalize and get kills because of it now two versus two 45 seconds left to go we're gonna see a little bit of a lull here we've got Ren Shiro just going in with the draw now can oh. Lucas find his man no he cannot and these are becoming tense, tense gunfights in the final 30 seconds. Two versus two, and Alems drops down onto that lower floor. Has the diffuser and takes the opportunity to put it down. He's got Renshiro on the cover, and once coming again, in. I'm just not too sure that G2 have got sufficient sight control, Des. They've allowed the attackers in there, and the diffuser goes down and is activated, and this flips the round on its head. And again, you'd be asking questions around how on earth two members of G2 have been so far from sight that we've seen the members of BDS get in, get the plant without even so much as a firefight. 25 seconds on the clock. They've got about 15 seconds to get these two kills and get the diffuser stuck. Else it's a 5-1 half. Renshiro finds one. It's turning into nothing for G2. Every late round clutch situation where they could come up big, BDS just shut the door in their face, catching the nose in the process. That's a 5-1 half, Tim. They've absolutely dominated G2 on the attack. Looking at that plant again, Des, you know, you've picked, you've commented on it there at the time, saying how are, in a two versus two, both members of BDS able to get into sight completely uncontested, and it just says that G2 weren't necessarily aware of exactly where they were, and they weren't focused on that site. As you say, it wasn't just that Elems was able to go in and get the plant down. He had Ren Shiro on the cover. Usually, in a two versus two, if you take that opportunity to get the diffuser down, sometimes you've at least got to take the risk of going in and just throwing it down. But no, he had Ren Shiro covering him as well. Whew. Well, from what the screaming in chat, there'll be a brief pause here, but my God, is that a shape-up so far? Concerning on the side of G2? Absolutely. The change coming in, rather than ringing on the book, on counter like they had before, it's going to be the IQ. And just to go through the picks on the other side, it was the Jaeger, the Frost, Rooney, Kaid, and Mira. One of those was meant to be sixth picked away. We'll find out when we get back in. I think we're going to have to have a remake of the lobby here. So it will be a couple of minutes. But there is a lot to break down in that first half around what was going wrong. And I guarantee you, G2 are going to need this time to have a conversation. They certainly are. I mean... <laughs> like you know, if, if we're he's looking, he's always for, so animated, isn't he? Loves he's a very emotional player, and I love for it. I love it. I'm here for it. I think you know, if we're looking at this Des, and we're trying to find, I'm not sure I'll even call it a silver lining, but we have seen Chalet be more attacker side. Let's at least say that. You know, let's at yeah. least be fair. Um, that is what we've seen historically so far. So can G2 get on to the attack and turn it around? Absolutely. There is the opportunity there for them. Does it look likely? I've got to say that it doesn't. And the reason that I say that is because they're not winning gunfights on the whole. Let's just have a look at that flurry of kills they got there, Des. They were all free. Citizen moves up and gets two without even being challenged. And don't get me wrong, that's the perfect way to play Siege. Shoot a player in the back, there's no risk to you. No. Get somebody with a Nitro, there's no risk to you. That's perfect, but you can't rely on it. Against teams like BDS, with the game sense they're playing with, you ain't going to catch them like that too often. Absolutely. And I've got to touch on what we need to see, I think, coming in from G2 in this half. Because from BDS, we saw impeccable droning. That was the only time, I think, in that game where we've seen them mess up on drones and where someone's got to flank off them from bathroom. And they didn't expect him to be there. 
they're used to Virtue being the one on the roam. They dealt with Virtue. He was more contained, but it's Citizen who comes up big and gets the double kill for them. So droning, absolutely number one. Time use. We only really had one, maybe two rounds where BDS were bringing it down to the wire. Outside of that, they just look comfortable. Never starving themselves for an opportunity late in the round. Always giving themselves plenty of paladin to operate within. And of course, you can't ignore the most obvious thing in a game like Siege, hitting the crucial shots. Winning their clutches, getting all the entries. They were slamming G2 in every single department in that first half and although we always say let's wait to the second half and see how things play out when we switch sides I still have a lot of concerns I'm not going to lie it's tough to watch this you know, is, is the honest answer to it. Um, you know, as an EUL caster, as a, a Siege fan that has followed uh, the Penta roster into G2 and, and seen this side and the, the history unfold, mm. it's tough to watch, is, is the honest answer. You know, BDS are really showing that they are the new power here. You know, they are the powerhouse, and that is exactly what they are coming in here as, and they have the answer to everything G2 try to throw at them. You know, no matter what the situation, if they're losing out there in the roaming gunfights, we'll just play into sight and put the diffuser down. And and right now, G2, they really do look all at sea. And I don't want to get onto the, the, the backs too much and be too <laughs> critical because, you know, it's not it's not what we want to do, but it, it's, it is it's, it's difficult. All right, change away then. So that IQ being subbed down instead for a Decaby. The other day when I saw them hovering the Lion for a second, I thought, are they taking some ideas from Team 1 here? Because Team 1 bought Lion in every single attacking round against G2. And my God, did it cause any end of drama for them in some of those rounds. We saw that massive swing back in the second half from Team 1. Just steamrolling their way through. It was quite terrifying is the best way that I can possibly describe it. No matter what G2 were doing, it hurt them hard. So I think here they're thinking themselves about, well, we know how effective they use it to shut us down on the Rome. Why don't we bring our own Rome control? And rather than leaving on the Lion, they're instead going again towards that decay with the smokes on site. Maybe thinking about that for their plants if they want to cut off those crucial lines of sight. Going to be seeing Master and Office then as BDS's first defensive site. Now we've got the Aruni there just using that melee ability. If you're unfamiliar with Aruni, she has a primary gadget, has the laser gates um, that will be applied to doors, windows, and just prevent, first of all, players from coming in through there. They will take, they can come in, but it will uh, cost them some hit points in order to do so. And they can be burnt out by throwing utility drones or any throwable utility through them um, and the laser gate will open up until reactivated by a defender after a period of time when that becomes available but as a secondary ability almost she's got this ability to punch through soft walls she take um, your jaw off is the way she certainly will it. using that artificial uh, limb that she's got she'll put holes in walls in ceilings floors and that is often you know another big part of what that operator is used for is that renovation of site to open up the angles um, that the defenders want I'm pretty sure when all these players saw, oh, Rooney, she looks amazing, then you realise that she can punch holes in walls and you think, oh, I'm basically going to be the new, uh, the smoke or the mute player on site opening up rotations and holes for everybody, which is exactly what her role becomes in the setup. Often you'll see 15 seconds into the round, she's still getting busy opening holes up. And speaking of opening things up, it's Kayak Skull, apparently, as LM finds him out with the opening kill. Again, this has just gone on and on. Is that, what, five or six of those now on their side? It's absolutely ludicrous, Tim. Last six rounds in a row have all gone to BDS Go on figure. the entry kills. And guess what there's? So is every single round. BDS are a team that once they have that man advantage, they will take you for everything you are worth. And they are continuing to do that here. Now we have a battle on the window and a great kill from Kanto onto LMs there. G2 trying to fight back, but once again, BDS have the answer as Ren Shiro finds a kill with the Frost. Headshot onto Uno, leaving us four versus is three right now and this has got to be exciting if you're a BDS fan there's you've got to be waiting with bated breath for what's going to come not just for the rest of the day but the rest of the tournament they're looking electric here on shall we I think after the other day they're not going 3-0 a few were like oh well let's all praise our saviors and empire the Fallen have risen once more. They're going to do some magic for us. But it's good to see that BDS are back on the wagon today. And my God, are putting up a show. Nice shot coming in from Virtue, mind you. My slight concern being a lot of these are blind. We saw them run like headlong into a barrel not too long ago with one of their members going down. I believe it was Uno. And the question kind of stands of, well, 
why? Like, why are we not droning out a little bit more here, taking a bit more patience? We've also got the Iana on side with that Gemini decoy to get in there and give us some more information. So it's being very mindful of that, but when you're in the final 15 seconds, being mindful isn't always the play, Ace. Rafal just looking to hold Citizen away from that door. He's going to try to push in. Now Rafal finds the kill, and what a nice drop he does to do it through the soft wall. Kanto, however, gets himself one onto Shaiko. A good game for him so far, but will be downed there. And ultimately, BDS win based on time, Des. G2 got themselves into good positions, found the kills, but just were unable to execute on two sites. Two deaths in the ground floor hallway, seemingly unaware of where the longer angles are coming from. BDS taking those freebies all day long. And I touched on it in the first half. BDS droned absolutely everything out. But for G2, two critical deaths there that they weren't aware were coming their way really comes back to sting them. And you can look at the trophy duel and say, yeah, that was good fun. Wasn't really that big a factor in the grand scheme of things is the way that I look at it. BDS slapping G2 off the park. It's six and one. Things going for bad to worse from G2. At least the other day, they got themselves to overtime. Here, they barely showed up. They really have, uh, you know, it, it's it's a struggle. There's there's no two ways about it. But BDS, they're going to be very, very happy with this result so far. The thing is, Des, I'm looking ahead to the rest of the day and this puts a lot more weight on the next matchup. Let's not forget, you know, coming away from a result like this, you could, you're just going to want to walk away from the game at that point. You're going to want to break, but G2 don't have that option because they're coming in to their second game of the day, which is going to be against Cyclops. And when if we start looking... That. Well, this is it. When we start looking forward now, you know, we're thinking, G2, where are the results going to come from? Of mm. course, only the bottom place team in the group will be relegated at this stage. So there's plenty of opportunity to still get through to those playoffs. But Cyclops are the other team that have been struggling for results so far. And it could come down to a scrap between G2 and Cyclops for that last place. So, or to avoid the last place rather. So a direct result, a win from G2 against Cyclops could be absolutely invaluable for them at this point. But they go into that match on the back of this one. You know what sounds really weird to be happy about? Not a single player in this game has got more than 10 or more kills. It's a real team effort from BDS where everyone is getting involved. Bree Day is one and five, but given he's being on the support duties, the rest of them are taking the kills. It's kind of hard to see where you're going to collect them. We've had one multi-kill in all seven rounds, and that was Shaiko with a 3k. Outside of that, it is a team effort, which to me is always promising to see that there isn't a reliance on Shaiko to pop off. Or on a day that he's quiet for Rafal to do it, like he did the other day, for example. Instead, it's a team-wide effort, and that is only going to help you when you start coming into future games. I'm always wondering now for other teams is... BDS have shown they can play Chalet. Are you really going to be willing to let them go here, given how good their attacks were? We've got Alems there just trying to hold down that important office position. He is on the Aruni. He's just um, looking to keep his angles for as long as possible. Shaiko backing him up as well. The site this time is dining and kitchen, but G2 are currently looking to get themselves some top floor control. Oh. Now then, Alems, that was unfortunate timing. Just sees his man, but can't manage to make shots land and fully aware of his position now. Virtue looking to make that challenge on. And this is one of the, the interesting points about those laser gates there that I'll try and make quickly as oh. the, the kills rain in. Kanto and Uno finding themselves two, and this is a better start to a round for G2 than we've seen throughout this map so far, getting themselves a nice two-man advantage. But when a player, when a defensive player approaches a laser gate, Des, it shuts off automatically to allow them to pass through. But in that sort of situation where Alems is trying to peek onto a door, all that's doing is telling the attackers oh. the peak is coming now. Yep. And you just know, it's almost like an information game for the attackers. The reverse, the C4 coming out, not quite going to connect as he steps away. But Kanto is down, mind you. Oh, it's a frost mat. Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? I was going to say, with a 5 versus 3 and about 75 seconds to play, G2 have no excuse to lose this one. Yes, Kanto's not dead, but it is in the 4 versus 3. The utility for BDS is gone. They've still got the cams to play with if they need them here and have a call left. I'm glad they've held on to it for this long. There is no excuse to lose this round. Ranchiro just looking for that head glitch from the bomb there, just keeping himself tight against the bomb chassis and just waiting for that pixel peak to present itself. Kanto Virtue still looking to work those top floor angles. Oh, 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 oh. There is the angle, there's Virtue loses the fight. Oh. Ranchiro gets himself a double. That's three on the round, three versus two. BDS, they flip the script here in round eight, put themselves on top. 
in what? power position, and Red Shiro's looking for an ace, but no, Kayak at least denies that, but Breedo steps in with the trade, with the kill, with the win, BDS absolutely dominant on Shally. What did I say not 45 seconds ago? Five versus three, or four versus three if you want to look at it and be slightly more cynical that way. No utility left. Everything is in favor of G2. They had the cams, they had the call from the Decay and they still throw it away. Continuous 1v1s and peaks onto Renshiro. He gets a 4K, puts his names up in lights for that round. Unbelievable from BDS, and you said it yourself, G2. Their mental must be in tatters. They've got to come up against Cyclops in their next game. Can't wait to sit on the desk for that one, because if we come out of that game saying it's 0 and 5 G2, where does the win come from? Well, this is it. They've got, what, 20 minutes, half an hour to turn that around now and to go into what could be the most important game of the Six Invitational for G2. If Cyclops can just pile on here and apply more pressure to them, it's not looking good. It is going to be problematic. I'm sure there are some very, very stern conversations taking place in the G2 camp right now. But for BDS, jubilance at their incredible form on a map they have not yet played since its release into the competitive map pool. Let's go to a break. And when we come back, the Aussies are going to talk you through what was an absolute slaughter by BDS over G2. See you soon.